and I had the opportunity to interview one of my bucket list people, Scott Toy Guru Nightlick, a former brand manager for Mattel, a veteran of the toy industry, just a creative and awesome and wonderful guy. He has a tremendously successful YouTube channel called Spector Creative, as well as a company that does consulting, and you can follow him on all sorts of places under the name Spector Creative. And this was just an amazing conversation, and I had so much fun doing it. And Leah, thank you for giving us permission to drop this on the Friday Night Movie Podcast feed. I hope everybody enjoys it, and I hope everybody is becomes a loyal listener of Finding Favorites. Enjoy. Hello, my name is Scott Toy Guru Nightlick, and my favorite thing is Arbor Day. <laughs> All right. That's cool. You do mention Arbor Day often in the channel. It's just a running gag. Welcome to the Finding Favorites podcast, where we explore your favorite things without using an algorithm. Here's your host, Leah Jones. <laughs> Welcome to Finding Favorites. I am your host, Leah Jones. It is, I'm recording this on Friday night, so Friday the 14th, but this will be coming out on January 16th. If you are new to to Finding Favorites, um, you probably came here because you know the my guest host this week, Shai Corman from Friday Night Movie Podcast and The Gold Nerds or you know his guest, or you want to know more about his guest, Scott, the toy guru, Nightlick. I asked uh, Shy and Amy Guth last week to be my guest host this month. I am in the final cycle of my chemotherapy. Um, this summer I was diagnosed with, ver- with stage one breast cancer, and I was able to keep up with the podcast until I wasn't able to keep up with the podcast anymore. So Shai is, is doing two interviews. Amy's doing two interviews. I'm so thrilled for their help and to hear what they do with the format and who they find to interview. So it's been really fun for me to see who people um, bring on stage with them. Like I said, I am in the final three weeks of chemotherapy. Today was my 10th infusion of 12. Um, I'm getting Taxol. And it is getting really hard. The hardest it's been for me is every week, basically. It's a crescendo. It's, they told me it was cumulative. Um, but like for really the first eight weeks, it was, I had steroids Saturday, steroids Sunday. I had a lot of energy. I was able to be social. Mondays and Tuesdays were kind of down days. Wednesdays and Thursdays were great. Um, this is the first week I've been on chemo that I had to nap through. I had to take daily naps instead of just napping through like Monday. I have a really short temper, uh, which is fine because I'm mostly isolating and not seeing a lot of people because Omicron is very scary. Um, my taste buds continue to be weird. I have my taste. I don't have COVID. I've done, I've done a lot of rapid tests. I'm swabbing my throat to get samples as well as my nose, but just like what I think is bland, bland food is a whole new definition. It's pretty wild. So I'm just, the fatigue is getting really bad. When I leave left chemo today on the walk from Prentice to the garage to get to the car, I had to stop and sit twice and it's a block and I'm still going to Pilates once a week um, so that I have some structured movement Pilates is two blocks away and I now take like, I have to plan like 20 minutes to walk there in order to not be like completely winded. Uh, So chemotherapy is hard. And then for months and months, my carrot at the end of chemotherapy has been a bunch of Doughboys live shows. Uh, One in Chicago the day after I finished chemotherapy and one in and two in Boston the following weekend. And those shows got postponed today because of Omicron. So that is the right thing to do. And I really appreciate that they're putting their fans' health and safety first. But I am so sad because I really wanted to mark the end of chemotherapy with being with my domies. So I'm really sad about that. But I'm going to Boston. 
I'm still going to Boston and I'm going to see, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go Boston in February and I'm going to see some of my internet friends who are my real friends. And so with that, I will turn it over to Shai Corman. Thank you, Shai. I also think it's funny that Scott said his favorite thing was Arbor Day. Uh, and this episode is coming out the weekend of Tu B'Shvat, which is like Jewish Arbor Day, the New Year of the Trees. Um, and so I think it's a very funny, timely intro. Wash your hands, wear your mask, get your boosters and vaccines, and keep enjoying your favorite things. Here we are on Finding Favorites, the podcast where we introduce you to your new favorite things, and uh, we do so without the algorithm. I am Shai Corman, filling in for my dear friend, my podcasting in arms, uh, Leah Jones. Uh, we wish Leah a awesome, speedy recovery, and I'm truly honored to be able to to be able to fill in for Leah this month. And one of the best parts of getting to fill in is that I got to pitch one of my dream bucket list interviews, uh, Scott Toy Guru Nightlick, who runs, among many things, the Spectre Creative YouTube channel, which is a must, must watch for anyone who loves pop culture. Uh, but he is a accomplished brand manager and leader in the toy industry and has this incredible wealth of knowledge that mixes child development and play patterns and business and I just, I'm ready to get into it. Scott, how are you doing today? I'm awesome. I'm apparently someone who can't figure out how to keep his uh, screen plugged in during an interview, so it doesn't fade, but I think we're good now. Okay. Oop, Thank you. No, it's great to be on and chat toys, and oh, I, I just appreciate all the kind words, and yeah, let, that's very much what the channel is all about, and uh, it's sort of unlocking that, you know, these, this is more, these are more than just collectibles or playthings. There's a lot more going on here. It's 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 amazing. I we'll get to we'll get to the part where you take us behind the curtain. But what I really want to start at because I think we're similar generationally. Similar generationally is let's start with your origin story. Where did the love of toys begin? What was the toy that started it all? The toy. Um, so well, let's say so. I grew up in in Connecticut. Uh, so a lot of out door play um and my, my earliest memories are are playing with fisher price uh little people like the, when they were made of you know wood and had the you know the, the, the little peg bodies oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. um i had a bunch of in fact some of the play sets are actually in my office um star wars masters of the universe constructs was a really big one it was a um I, I caught my wife trying to throw out a box of my constructs recently i love constructs <gasps> Oh no, you cannot. Yes, constructs like I don't understand why they're not like Lego, like Evergreen. Just constructs. It should have its own aisle. Why did it go away? Um, that's, that's yeah. So then they basically combine everything. That's that. That's amazing. Okay, so all of those toys, I, I recognize all of those toys. They all are warm in my heart. Now, most kids dream about oh i'm gonna work i want to make toys or they see the movie big and you see tom hanks's character working in the store but you actually went and made a multi-decade career making toys how do you jump from kid who loves those toys to actually getting to make such an incredible impact on the industry so the question how did i get yeah actually into working in the toy yeah. industry living the dream um so Grew up in Connecticut, but moved to California. And every in or, I lived in Orange County. And every time we would drive up to Los Angeles, we'd pass the giant Mattel building in Hawthorne. It's a big, big brick building with a giant Mattel logo facing the freeway. So it, it was very much like, whoa, there's a toy company like right here in my backyard. Um, and I, you know, I wound up applying there right after college. And they were like, great, we have your resume on file. Bye. What I wound up doing is going into pharmaceutical marketing. Uh, and that wound up being by fluke a way into toys because the, the four years I spent doing advertising for – I was on a uh, glaucoma account 
I could tell you more about like inner eye care than you ever wanted to know. Oh, wow. um, and my ability, well, I guess I didn't think of it as an ability, but a skill set to navigate all of the fine print of a medical ad, you know, like all the, you know, safety warnings and counterindications is very transferable to the toy industry in this, that packaging also has warnings and licensor lights and small parts and all of that stuff. So when I wound up connecting with someone at Mattel who, uh, and they had an opening for a writer when they saw what my portfolio was, they're like, oh, we're looking for someone who can do this. And I was like, oh, I didn't even know that was a thing. But yes, I can. <laughs> um, so that's how I got started. And it just, uh, you know, kind of every time there was an opportunity, I took it and just sort of kept doing more and more. Uh, one of your major roles, and you see it in your channel, is that is the role you played with Masters of the Universe. Um, could you talk a little bit about your role there and how you how you make it into the toy you were playing with as a kid? And then, like, what's that application like? I, I really love playing with this. Can I can I work on it? So, uh, it's funny you the, the way you ask that because that that's how so many people think it is. Uh, you know, when I was with Mattel or other toy companies, I would get people coming up to me at San Diego Comic Con in the booth, you know, saying, I want to work on toys. I want to work on He Man or Batman or, you know, Star Wars, whatever it was. And I'd be like, great, what do you want to do? And the answer would be like, well, I want to work on toys. And it was like, oh, what? I mean, there's a hundred different jobs of people that work on toys. There's marketing and sculptors and packaging designers and finance people, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, the big difference um, on my end for how I got in was that I actually had a f four years of professional work. As far as how did I get to move over from what I, I got hired to work on Hot Wheels, but to actually work on He-Man, which is, yeah, it was a dream project. Um, I made a pitch to upper management that we, we as a company weren't doing enough for on toys and none of that was with my own company. And at the time, I, Mattel was licensing out He-Man to NECA to make staction figures. When I finally got my appointment with upper management to propose this, you know, I, I took them out of a crate. I was like, look, you know, we're letting another company make this. We could make this. Um, and that, so basically they moved me over from the writing group into marketing. First of all, what's a staction character and what's the appeal of a company making it versus just getting paid to sit home and make money while you sleep and license it? Great question. So one, a staction figure, um, I guess it's an industry term or, or a collector term for a non-articulated action figure. Oh, wow. So technically it's a statue, but usually to make something a staction figure, it's sculpted to look like an action figure. Um, another example is Kevin Smith did an animated line of Clerks characters. Um, I think he called them in-action figures. But specifically, these NECA Masters of the Universe toys were sculpted to look like they were part of the 2000X toy line that the Horsemen did. Um, they just didn't articulate, which made them a lot less expensive to make. So for people who were just displaying their toys, like most collectors, you could just put these figures in the back or on the last row, and it would just look like they blended in with your toy line. That's the appeal. Got it. Got it. And then... But Mattel then says, okay, no, we're going to go take the financial risk and start making the toys ourselves again. What, 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 what's the push there? I feel like licensing sounds like a pretty good deal. Someone else takes the financial risk and you, you, keep, you keep the checks. Which is what happened also when I left Mattel and the brand basically got shuffled to Super 7. That's more or less exactly what did happen. Um, so, you know, why, why will it do it? Mostly um, publicity PR, um, both with uh, consumers, with the fan base, but also industry-wide to be like, you know, hey, we're Mattel. We also do this. We make dolls. We make die-cast cars. And we can make a, you know, high-end adult collector line, if, you know, if we need to. So you, Mr. IP owner, should let us make toys of your IP because we can do all this. Got it. Got it. Is is I guess Master of the Universe is is a Mattel IP by definition. Um, it's like a Facebook relationship. It's complicated. Okay, got um, it. <laughs> but it, it it was originally created, yes, by Mattel. Um, since then, it's got undergone a lot of breaking apart and sales of different chunks to different people. But it was originally created in '82 at Mattel. 
So before we take our first break, you talk about you, the way you talk about toys on your channel that I love so much is a deep love for toys. You talk about play patterns. You talk about why a kid would want to place it, why the box is on the bottom of the shelf. I love all of those videos. And here you are, you're telling me about business and PR and all of these things. How do some people, when they go into their dream industry, they kind of lose their love for it. How do you maintain that love, that soul, while also having worked in the corporate world? It's a tough question because it does, I've seen it drive it out of people, like fellow people at companies who, who were collectors, who like after you know three or five years, they're like, yeah, whatever. I can just order this and have the master carton brought to me like, I don't, you know, the thrill is gone. Um, I, I, I guess just, yeah, well, basically it's just that much of a love and, you know, but also, you know, I think it comes from an understanding that there is a corporate framework and you can't just, you know, make any toy you want. Some, I mean, you know, Mattel paid to make all of these toys at the end of the day. I mean, they sold them and made money, but they had to put the money up front. So, you know, convincing a company to do that is not, the easiest task in the world. Um, you know, there's, I think just being aware of that, 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 you know, is, is, and that that's part of the product. It's, it's like a movie, how a movie is a team effort to make. It's not just the actor, the director, the special effect, everyone has to come together and same thing with toys. So there's a self-awareness there that it seems that if you have it, then you still get to maintain your enjoyment. I think so. Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I don't think anyone's ever actually asked me that question before, and I have seen it die off in other people. Um, but I still get giddy when I find a new toy that I actively collect on the shelf. So, you know. That's that's awesome. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and then I'm going to ask you about your collections. Okay, Scott. You, we talked about the the collector that's in your heart. What do you still collect now, or what are your all time favorite toys to collect? I myself, every once in a while, even as an adult, get 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 sucked in. What are what are the ones that you really love? Um. Well, um, I've ne I I have not stopped collecting Star Wars three and three fourths since ninety five. Wow. Um. You know, I mean, I had them when I was a kid, and then that was the the Power of the Force two that orange carded wave. That was like what pulled me back into sort of that bridge. That was the first toy I think I bought, considering myself. I was buying this to collect it, not to play with it. If which you will, were the, which were the Power of the Forces that had the metal coins? Like the, my all time favorite Star Wars toy, and I have the same one from when I was a kid on display on a shelf that my kids are not allowed to touch. Is the Luke Skywalker? with the helmet, you know, with the stormtrooper outfit that came with a coin, which, which line was that? All right. So that was the very last line from the eighties oh. in 85. It was called power of the force. God, when they relaunched it in 95. So the 10 year gap, uh, it, they, they also called it power of the force, but collectors called it power of the force two, because hence that was one. And this was two, um, and, and yeah, I mean, that was definitely the line that sucked me into collecting. And so, you know, just last week I got Bib Fortuna and Lobot in the vintage collection, which is the latest releases in what, 30 years of collecting that line. So. Oh, wow. So when you buy, when you buy a Bib Fortuna or a Lobot, everyone who's listening, we go, I mean, Leah does such a great job at bringing such a diverse group of speakers. So I actually think people will know what I'm talking about. But Bib Fortuna was recently off in the in the at the in the last scene of The Mandalorian, the Twi'lek with the long white uh, tentacles. What are they? Ears? <laughs> the, there, I think there's a technical term called Lakus, L-E-K-U-S, or something. They're they're tentacles. Yeah, ja, but they can ja, ja, they ja, Jabba's major domo, and then uh, Lobot is the dude with the puffy uh, sleeves that had the the earphones around his head and Cloud City. Uh, so when you say you bought the vintage line, that is a reissue essentially of the original line from the eighties. Oh, it gets so confusing, and part of this is just 
difficulty in marketing a brand <laughs> like this. So I, I don't because I well, I have, I've never worked on I haven't worked for Hasbro, so I don't I don't know the ins and outs. But basically, okay, let's see. There's been a continuous three and three fourth scale line since '95, more or less, um, which is the same scale the figures were back in the '80s, three and three fourth. And that counts the super muscle bound uh, Qui Gon Jinn group. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, although I only collect original trilogy, that's my like you know ah, okay. bug. So you I mean, have I do, your your borders. Yep, it keeps the wallet from exploding. It's like, nope, I'm not <laughs> getting that. That's not original trilogy. I mean, I bought you know some here and there, but if it's original trilogy, I'm like, well, that's a pre-bought purchase. Like that, I bought that before <laughs> they announced it. Um. Okay, so I don't even remember. So. Sorry, what was the question? Oh, I was saying question? what you mentioned. You bought the vintage line, but you oh, must oh, yeah, have those. Is... You must have Lobot and Bib Fortuna from the eighties because I have those, and I wouldn't say I'm an expert collector. I collect, but I'm not an expert collector. So when you're you're buying it for a second time or maybe a third time at that point? Okay, so um, that continuous more or less line of three and three fourth figures from ninety five are all new versions of the say of a character. So it's not like a recreation of the Bib Fortuna we had from 1983. It's a modern, and each time they come out with another one, it's more advanced as far as toy making. The one that they just came out with has a lot more articulation and better paint than any previous one. So this, so one of the best, I love, it's okay if I keep advertising your videos, but one of my favorite videos you Spectre gave Creative, check it out. On Spectre Creative, on Spectre Creative is the one that you made, or maybe you've done more than one of this, but on tooling which is the which is essentially the casting of all the different parts so they are creating new tooling that the, these are like the casts or the the uh, the plates if they were if they were money if you were you know counterfeiting money um the plates of the new bib fortuna is not the same one that's been sitting around since the 80s um not no not even uh close and and i mean that, sorry that sounded a little rude but <laughs> for a few reasons one they don't last that long Oh, okay. um, they do get worn out, but they also over time break. And they're also very expensive to store because they're giant metal cubes. If you think about it, you know, that split open. And yeah, as you oh, said, and they the, put the, the goo mold. in and the goo, all toys are made of goo. Exactly. <laughs> they put the goo in. Um, so now here's where it gets confusing because one of the trends going on right now is to actually recreate a one-to-one -one of the, of the original toy. So when you asked about getting a Bib Fortuna like that, well, they haven't actually done Bib Fortuna. They've done a lot of the other major characters, Darth Vader, Chewbacca, the, yada, the yada. Luke Skywalker with the blonde hair and the sort of oval-shaped head. I had that, that exactly that one, yes. And so they've that is a line they call the retro collection. Uh, if you Google like Hasbro or Kenner kind of retro, what you'll see is they're literally one to one right now, but they are brand new tools. Oh, okay. Like it's so it's so they basically take they buy an old one off eBay <laughs> and they give it to they give it to the tooling sculpting company and say recreate this, which is why you'll notice they're just they're basically copy of a copy is the way to think is way huh. to think about it. Um, but it is a big trend right now doing recreations of toys we had as kids, and that's a whole other you know psychological issue. But um, so there is hypothetically a Bib Fortuna that is a recreation of the actual toy we had. It just hasn't come out yet, but there's, there's a line to support that execution. That's very cool. So let's, let's, let's just dive into Star Wars for a second here. So the original line has some, you know, very famous, I don't know if they're your Holy grails, but growing up, especially before the internet, when, you know, you were going to a Comic-Con in the eighties or nineties, you know, there was the yak face, the blue snaggle tooth, um, the first Boba Fett with the rocket that may or may not exist that put that shoots people in the eye that yep. has to be changed. Do do you have any of those? <laughs> <laughs> um, not not for Star Wars. Um, and I'm not what what I do want to do one day is is own the entire vintage line, which is 92 or 96 or 120, depending on how you count variants figures. Um, that's sort of my holy grail is to re is to basic because I, I thought I had all of them when I was an adult and saw a picture in a, in a book of all 92. I was like, oh, I only owned like 30 or 40 of these, less than half. Oh, wow. Um, thinking I had so many more because when you're a kid, um, 
I do have a lot of rare toys from things I have worked on, like He-Man and DC. Um, but having never worked on Star Wars or, you know, I was a kid when that line was out. So, no, I don't own a rocket firing Boba Fett, but I know stories about so much of it from just talking to so many people in the industry. And that's what makes a lot of the cool videos on the channel. Oh, that's so cool. And when it comes to when it comes to the the old the old toys, uh, there's a criticism that I hear lobbed at the toys from the 80s all the time in an offhanded way by usually by people, frankly, who don't love them, which is, well, Transformers was just a show created to sell a toy. He-Man was just a show created to, created to sell a toy. But I got to tell you, I rewatch old school Transformers, particularly, by the way, I think season three has a really strong narrative. I He-Man's terrific. Even better, I think, narrative wise is Shira, which I think I've heard you say on your channel before as well. I'm not sure if that if I'm quoting you right, but I, I like. Yeah, I enjoy a good Shira episode more than a good He-Man episode of Filmation. Uh, um, but I don't think that made the show or G.I. Joe, you know, I don't think that made these shows bad at all. In fact, I I I, th I remember as a kid having new vehicles and new characters introduced that kept me interested. That kept me excited. Yeah, it made me want to buy new characters, but I felt like it was constantly mainlining imagination energy on into my brain. Uh, what do you think of that criticism? Do you think it's fair? Do you think it made good shows, bad shows? What's your take on that? Uh, very, again, very great questions. Um, so p a part of it is understanding like, like why that was able to happen. Um, and then part of it is, is looking at the fact, as you said, you know, it was like pumping this pop culture into our brains. Um, having, you know, He-Man on every day at four o'clock or, you know, what, whatever, whatever the scheduled time when you tuned in with your rabbit ears to watch an episode um, you then, it was the equivalent of, it's like the water cooler effect um, at office. I would call it, you know, like the around the slide effect that you gather at the playground the next day and talk about what happened on He-Man or She-Ra or Transformers or My Little Pony or whatever, um, but not Rainbow Bright. We're not going to talk about Rainbow Bright. <laughs> um, so that is really, I think that one of the most important things to come out of that is that it led to a communal fan base which now, you know, kids just binge something in like a day and it's done and they move on to the next thing and there's no coordinating their binge with everyone else at school. Everyone's binging whatever they're binging when they're binging it. So there's no communal, there's no time to build an audience before kids today have just moved on to binging the next thing um, or just making their own videos on TikTok now. So um, it was, that, so that's sort of like the back end answer to the question, but I think it's also important to take into a that because of the of the Reagan administration's deregulation of the FCC in 80, 81 is what allowed this to happen. And then Congress reversed that in 89, 90. So we had like these magical eight, nine years where this stuff could happen. And but looking back, your original question, like, was this a positive thing? Well, look at all the cool stuff that came out of those nine years. Those like, are the best everything. toys. I know. And like, look at how much we love, like that there's never been a nine year, you know, spawning of so much stuff ever. Um, and it was because of the deregulation that you could now make these shows to, to promote product lines. I, I think there are some great shows for kids. Uh, I don't know what you watch or, or if you have kids and you watch with them, but there are some great, very narratively strong shows. Airbender, Avatar, the Avatar verse is one of my favorite things. I just started watching Gravity Falls with my kids. Terrific. And what's funny is my instinct is I'm like, great, where are the toys to these? Like, why why aren't the kids then playing with the action figures? But there isn't as much of a connection to action figures as as it was when we were little. Like you saw that guy on TV. You could then go and build your entire Zartan showed up on G.I. Joe. Boom, go out and find that Zartan. It'll change colors and you can make your own Zartan story. I don't feel like kids are given the same agency with the toys the way we were. I would I would agree with that. And, you know, toys are changing a lot right now in the way kids play. Um, you know, not just, you know, the obvious stuff like fidget toys and screens, 
But the last two years of being locked up, the long-term psychological damage this is going to have on children is, it's ridiculous how little it's being discussed. Um, you know, kids, especially the younger ones, like the, the ones that were like three to six during this whole fun, are really going to have a lot of issues now because t- toys, are, they, they missed on those important toy playing years where toys help you figure out the world. And, you know, they lost being able to see people's facial expressions, which is how kids relate to other human beings or monkeys. Um, so, it, yeah, it's, um, it's, gonna, it's a weird, and with prices going up and they want to get rid of packaging and every, all the toys now have to be politically correct. And like, it, it's a very weird time to be making toys right now. Um, that's, that's, oh, that's, that's wild. You know, one toy that we haven't really talked about, but my kids got into, I have two daughters, uh, an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old. They got really into Lego during this period. I know Lego has like been a big thing and boy, is that expensive, by the way, it's not a habit that I really want it, but they're, they've really <laughs> dug Lego during the pandemic because they love the problem solving it and not necessarily, I know there's Lego that's marketed. They're still doing this marketing for girls and boys, not something we've necessarily followed in our house because I'm the one who loves toys, so I buy a lot of the toys. Um, but our kids really dig like the Harry Potter Legos, and that's the closest experience I can approximate to what I had with action figures. Where, where does Lego fit into the whole story of toys and, and kids? Um, Lego, I mean, obviously one of the most popular toys with kids. It's the highest netting. I mean, it brings them more revenue than... Uh, any other toy company, Mattel and Hasbro included, you know, has a higher wow. sales volume. Um, they surpassed them a few years ago. Uh, Lego and the, the way they phrase it, especially corporately, is they view it as a think of it like a plastic form of clay, where the Lego brick is the is the building block, is the clay, is is what you're making things out of, and Lego is a system that lets you make anything you want out of Lego, out of you know bricks and you know little lego men um so it, it, it's what's called construction play in the in the toy industry like that's the construction aisle even though it's 90 percent lego so what you're seeing with your, your kids especially them playing with lego during the pandemic is because they're looking for a sense of accomplishment and one of the things that lego provides is that because when you finish building whatever you're building you can look back and say i built this you know i made this there's something physical there um, and when they're getting very little of that in the real world, um, you know, that's absolutely, we've seen a lot of kids reaching for, for Lego and, and art and creative toys during the pandemic. Wow. That's really cool. Okay. We're going to take a short break and then we're going to move into talking to Scott about the, the, the world, uh, the, the crossover world of toys and movies. Cause that's, that's a, a special interest to me. Okay, Scott, uh, most folks know that I'm a movie TV fanatic. We talked about TV shows. Let's talk about movies. Let's talk about the hopes and dreams of the 80s kids and our favorite toys being turned it turned into films, uh, particularly these live action films. What's your take on the what, what do you think is the best live action toy film that's been made? Of, of based on the actual action figure. So excluding a Toy Story or a, or maybe you could count the Lego movies. Maybe, maybe you do count the Lego movies, maybe you don't. But but what's the, been the most successful transition of a toy to the big screen? Um, I mean, from a financial standpoint, it's going to be Transformers, hands down. Um, and a big part of that is because of the international market that uh, robot smashing robot can be understood in any language. Um, <laughs> And that's why, I mean, what was it? Transformers three or four, one of them, like for no reason takes place in Hong Kong for the second half of the movie. Um, because yeah, they wanted to be able to release it in China. Um, so yeah, no brainer Transformers outperforms everything and the toys continue to sell when there's a movie. Um, for me, per, I mean, you know, do you look at, you know, would you call the Avengers a toy movie? 
Um, I mean, they're that, more of a comic to me, book. That's book. a comic book movie because in my mind, the toys really came from the the hype of the movie. Well, I don't know really. I, it's hard for me to tell, but in, in my mind, I guess the Avengers movies maybe, but but not so much. But maybe that's also my own bias of being a kid. But I like my Avengers toys. The closest thing we had to Avengers toys when I was little were the Secret Wars. Like I had a Magneto that had the hologram. I know you reference that sometimes in, on the Spectre Creative channel is the the Secret Wars guys that had the shield, yeah. the hologram. That that's Those are the earliest Marvel toys I remember. So I don't feel like- Magneto were... had no cape. He did have no cape. He did yeah. have no cape. Um, so, and yeah, so I think by toy movie, you mean something more like, you know, like, like G.I. Joe, Transformers, Max Steel, like a movie actually made from a toy line. Exactly. Um, and honestly, if you look, there's really not that many. Um, I mean, you know, G.I. Joe has floundered at the box office and tried a few times. Transformers has succeeded. Um, Max Steel was if not, a, most people don't even know that was made. Um, was that a Donny? Was that a Marky Mark Wahlberg movie, maybe, or something like that? No, it wasn't Marky Mark, but it was like that. It was. <laughs> You know, young kid teams with space robot to fight other space robot guys. Oh, but oh, I'm mi- yeah, I'm mixing that up with some of the video yeah. game movie, maybe. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can't. Let, so what do you think like- goes? What do you think goes wrong? Right? Yes, the Transformers movies were wildly uh, successful, but aside from Bumblebee, where the characters actually started to approximate looking like they did when we when we grew up, why do folks not? Why, why do the, why do people walk away being these are critical disasters? How why don't they just grab the narrative from the old shows and put them on screen? Seems like less work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a whole other you know can of worms. Um, you know, a lot a lot of things are made these days by spreadsheets. You know, like <laughs> and you know you've got to have this element this element this type of person this type of hero check 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 okay everything works it should be the mathematical formula that is a hit movie oh it didn't work we must have had the formula wrong quick tweak it and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know we've seen this with a lot of recent movies that are aimed at sort of the geek audience um so yeah it's it, it why the, yeah I, I always wonder that because you know if you go to see you know, Tale of Two Cities or Pride and Prejudice, like they basically pick up from the book and just tell you the yeah. same story. But every time they do Captain America or Transformers or Star Wars, they have to like reinvent everything. Like, like they can't just do the Thrawn trilogy for Star Wars or they can't just do, right. you know, <laughs> like I, I always wonder this because I'm like, yeah, if I went to go see, you know, Oliver Twist, like I, I'm not expecting robots and werewolves to show up anytime <laughs> before page 200. So yeah, it's weird that classic literature gets that, but modern stuff has always got to be like, Oh, we're going to reinterpret it and make it our own. And, you know, the, the Thrawn trilogy is an aside, which is by Timothy Zahn. It's the, the, now, now it's been pushed off to be star Wars legends. To me, that's they've tried to fight that. And in the end they're right back at it because they're using a lot of the good stuff from that, whether it's, you know, in, in the Mandalorian and in other places. So, and, and in the card animated shows. So maybe they, maybe they should just start it there. <laughs> Irony is not without a sense of reality. Yes. <laughs> and you, you mentioned before He-Man 2000 and X, I believe that's a reference to the early 2000s animated series, which I, I thought was a really excellent update. Of He Man, like I watched that as a grown up, and I thought, "Wow, this is He Man." Only it's got more of a deeper narrative, almost like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings type of lore that that's baked into an ongoing story. Um, there was GI Joe Renegades, which to me I thought was really excellent, an excellent update A Team version of GI Joe, but far better than the movies. Are there and there's an update of Thundercats that I watched a little bit of. Are there interpretations that you've seen either in the animated world or in the TV world that you say, Oh no, this was, this was solid. I like this one. This one, this one was a worthy update. Interesting question. Um, that, that he man show that was the Mike young production show. Yeah. That ran 2001, 2002 ish. Um, I totally agree with your assessment of it. It was like he man, but it was like perfectly updated. Unfortunately, 
kids of the time didn't like it at all. Um, and it was <laughs> okay, it, that's it, what happened to it. Yeah, I mean, there were other issues with case packs and and the um, airing time of the show kept moving around. But at the end of the day, kids just didn't uh, get into a giant muscle man running around in furry underwear. That played in the '80s very much. I mean, you know, you had Rambo and the Terminator, and every everybody was made of muscles in the '80s, and we were fighting communism and you know all of that. So muscles made sense. Flash forward to 2001, 2002, and that message wasn't working with kids, and they totally it, – it, it, that kind of illustrates – And they weren't interested in the politics between Stratos's society and Buzz-Offs, which I thought was one of the most fascinating episodes. Yeah, but I am. That's, that's exactly why <laughs> I want to see. I want to you know, know why Merman's people aren't talking to you know the little skunk guys that turn into Stinkor like – <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Everything you just said. Perfect. And it's funny how like the new Netflix show tried to do that very much. Um, you know, I just that there were I think there were some uh, communication issues with the fans of what they were going to be able to do. I yeah, I mean, that Netflix show, I feel like I so I'm in communications, you know, job in my day job and. I rarely like when people blame communications because I think a lot of the times it, it really comes back to the substance of what it is. But this was a clear case where I, I thought I haven't finished it, but I thought it was terrific. The, the amount of it that I've watched. But if you were walking in expecting He-Man after they offended that first episode and then they only released half the series right at the point where it looks like He-Man's never coming back, <laughs> that is a tough pill to swallow um that is a tough pill to swallow but what did you think of that show did you uh, without the marketing communication element what did you think of the kevin smith adaptation um visually my favorite thing was how it looked visually i thought it was just beautiful looking oh, i mean the colors gorgeous. you know all of that um i like the first call it first half better than the second half um, the issues, you know, with like, yeah, He-Man disappearing and Tila taking it over that I had z zero issue with because I like a good what if I like a good like, you know, what would happen if He-Man wasn't available and Tila had like that's I'll watch that. The problem was that's not how it was marketed. It was marketed very differently. So people went in, yeah, with the expectations. So that aside, I liked the first half. I liked it as a cool Tila story. You know, that was awesome. It was really freaky to see things I like came up with in the uh, classics line wind up in the show oh, like wow. Vicor and, you know, like uh, clamp champs, real name and you know oh, stuff wow. like that. I was like, Hey, that's crazy. That's like totally they, came from classics. That's awesome. Yeah. They, 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 did they send you, did they ever like send you an email? They're like, Hey, you're, you just have to watch it to find out. Just got to watch it. Like that Mattel owns all the work I did. And that's just one of the things you do, but Hey, I got to come up with a real name for clamp champ and it was used on screen now. So yay. That's pretty awesome. And they used so, to, they did some really cool stuff like that that really referenced the toys beautifully. Like Wonder Bread He Man is now uh, or, right is essentially or or, or the the brown haired He Man. In my mind is that Wonder Bread He Man. He essentially yeah, yeah. is a character now in that. Lives well, in and we and we did. He was in classics. They, they picked up. That's exactly another example. And we did that deliberately in classics, like not just making that like you know. Uh, you know, variant He-Man or, you know, Wonder Bread, you know, we made him, a, him and Vicor and other characters based on concept art into legitimate characters for exactly that reason. So they could be marketed and other toys and content could be made from them. And it wasn't just, you know, Ralph McQuarrie, Luke Skywalker, like a concept drawing of Luke Skywalker done as an action figure. This was, we were taking the concept drawings and turning them into marketable characters. And, I, and then seeing that on Revelations, it was like, Whoa, mind blowing, man. I like went with us. I loved, I mean, hats off to you because I love those the way they they're not even Easter eggs. They made them part of the story. They weren't just fan service. They were taking what you had created in the toy line. Back to this previous conversation we were having about the making a show about toys. They were taking the creativity that went into that and bolstering the narrative with it. I thought it was terrific. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think in the second half, um, there were just too many reversals for me, mm. um, you know, and the whole, like the whole buildup of Skeletor trying to figure out how Adam called on the power without the sword. 
like that was his motivation throughout the first three episodes, you know, after seeing Adam turn into like this humongous guy. And then it just went away. It disappeared. Like Skeletor completely dropped that. Right. And He's like evil ends now super powerful. So let's forget about that and move on to this thing. And it felt like there were a few of those. Um, yeah, I, so I, I just, haven't gotten to the end yet, so I'll, I have okay. got one episode to go. So but there's right. a lot to Spoiler. wrap up. I'll say this. No, no, you haven't spoiled anything, but I'm just saying there's a lot to wrap up for how many reversals there were. Yeah, yeah. So um, Scott Toyguru Nightlick, the creator of the uh, Spectre Creative YouTube channel, but also veteran of the toy industry. Uh, before we get going, I would love to play a couple. Uh, I would love to import to Finding Favorites a couple of the signature, the signature game that we play on Friday Night Movie. Um, as a as a uh, that I've played many times with Leah when she's been a guest on the show, and I'm going to throw a cup and and that game is buy rent meh and buy rent meh. There are three values: one is buy, one is rent, one is meh. They are based of well, buy and rent are based on the old blockbuster video era, uh, which we're both familiar with. And buy being the highest value, you would buy it, you'd take it home. Rent, you'd take that movie out for four bucks and bring it back a couple of days late, hopefully, or ho not not late because then you might as well have bought it. And then uh, meh can be whatever you mean. Meh, you can assign a lot of value and meaning to depending on how you deliver that meh. So it's not necessarily the lowest, but it is a meh. And so let's start easy with some classic toy lines from the 80s. I'll give you these three, Masters of the Universe, Star Wars, one we haven't talked about, but one that I really love and wish I had had as a kid but never got to is Thundercats. Buy, uh, rent, rent man. Rent. I like Thundercats. Um but I, yeah, they, I never, like, I sort of got, they came out when I was getting a little, like, I guess, old for that first batch of figures, probably similar. And yeah, I just, I mean, they were cool. Like I never, but I just never got into them. And Star Wars Masters of the Universe? Those are by. Those are buys. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to, now let's pit three against each other. So you can only pick one for each of these. Okay. And we're going to go with guys wearing Mandalorian helmets in honor of the book of Boba Fett coming out. So we've got Boba Fett, Jango Fett, and the Mando, Din Djar Jin Djarin, or Din Djarin. Um, how would you rank those in buy, rent, meh? Like buying those masks to wear them? Oh, oh no, no, those characters. How would you, oh. which one would you buy, which one would you rent, and which one would you meh? Oh, okay. I got it. I got it. All right. I would, I would buy uh, Mando, I would rent Boba Fett, and I would meh Jango Fett. Wow, you'd rent Boba Fett. That's what's your what's your that's that's a bold choice. What what what's the rationale behind buying Mando and renting Boba? Um, I went into Mando with very low expectations, and it absolutely blew me away. Um, you know, Boba Fett's. Oh, I mean, growing up in the '80s, like we had our two minutes and eight seconds of Boba Fett on screen. Like, yeah, he's really awesome. Um. Besides him just being another masked, awesome Star Wars character that I was never really like, you know, cheering for him or excited when he showed up. It was just, you know, hey, it's Boba Fett. Yeah, everyone loves him. He's like, you know, the popular kid. And, um, and, I, like, and I do, by the way, recommend people check out one of, I think it's the latest Spectre Creative video as of recording this. Or or no, maybe that maybe the second later. There's a recent one you just did on George Lucas's attitude towards Boba Fett and changing attitude towards Boba Fett that I thought was really cool. I won't give any spoilers of that one, but it's yeah. And, and, and a summary of all the different times media has had him crawl out of the set, out of the, uh, <laughs> so like that, because it's happened like every five years in something that, else. That, that's right. Um, and Django just, he's just. Django is the product of a spreadsheet, you know, <laughs> we need the helmet in this movie. Yeah. Like, I mean, they know they really thought he was going to be more popular than Boba Fett. Like he was going to be this generate, you know, he was, but now, but now it's Mando. So there you go. There, there you go. All right. And now I want to have a little fun. There are some He-Man characters that, you know, and I've read a bunch of articles about different He-Man Masters of the Universe classic characters, not the classics line that you worked on, but the classic ones or, or from that era that are, are more made fun of the one that is always at the top of my list of stink or which my parents brought home to me because he was embedded with an actual skunk smell i took him i played with him in the bath i then smelled like a skunk for days <laughs> so they returned they returned stink or to the store and i never had stink or again so i uh, give you three here uh by renter mess stink or then gwildor who was added later 
because of the canon films masters of the universe he was like the orco knockoff played by the great billy barty and rock on it could be either of the rock lords although i happen to have loved the rock lords as a kid i did i was guy character who turns into rock did not phase me i thought that was awesome but rock on and the rock lords what how would you rank those by rent or miss stink or gwildor rock on Oh, I mean, I rock on and stone were two of my absolute favorite figures. Like I was so excited when we finally got to them in the classics line and updated them. Um, so they, yeah, they'd be a buy. I had um, stone as a kid. I had stone He was so rad. And even super seven made Granita, who is the girl uh, stone Lord. <laughs> awesome. um, when they got, when they continued the line for like a year or two, uh, Stinkor, I never had him. My, my best friend did smelled like patchouli. Never really my favorite. Gwildor, the old toy, kind of looks like a weird hobbit gnome <laughs> thing. But he's got the time travel. So I guess I'll go Gwildor, Rent, and Stink or Meh. Because <laughs> yeah. I don't like patchouli. My, my parents, my parents would agree. Um, all right, Scott. Uh, before we close out, uh, remind people where they can uh, follow you and all of the amazing stuff you're doing with Spectre Creative. All the amazing stuff. Thank you so much for the kind words. Um, so Spectre Creative on YouTube. That's Spectre, S-P-E-C-T-O-R, Spectre Creative. And you can also go to SpectreCreative.com, which is, um, besides making YouTube content to promote Spectre Creative, what I actually do is I consult with other toy companies, entrepreneurs, people who have ideas for product. It doesn't have to be toy product. I've done uh, beauty product. I've done, uh, I have a client who does uh, knitting quilts. But I've done a lot of my clients are toy based and it's arranged between actual companies and entrepreneurs. So anyone who has an idea for a toy or a product and you need help getting it to retail, content, branding, marketing, you can go to spectorcreative.com and uh, check out the YouTube channel for daily videos about toys and pop culture and how many times Boba Fett has crawled out of a giant pit. <laughs> That's amazing. And um, well, you can... You, you should follow, well, you're already subscribing and listening to Finding Favorites with Leah Jones. You should also be checking out Leah's other podcast, Candy Chat Chicago, that she hosts with the inimitable Jocelyn Gayboy, where they talk about candy every week and they rate different candies and people send in mountains of candy to them now. And it is truly one of the funniest uh candy comedy it is the only candy comedy show i've ever listened to um but if you'd like to listen to me on a regular basis i co-host the friday night movie podcast with my sisters it's all sibling rivalry and pop culture every week um and that podcast can be picked up at friday night moviepod.com or you can follow me at pancake for table that's pancake and the number for table on twitter and instagram a huge thank you to scott toy guru nightlick and uh a big hug and get well soon to leah jones thanks for listening thank you for listening to finding favorites with leah jones please make sure to subscribe and drop us a five-star review on itunes now go out and enjoy your favorite things